Uh, thank you very much indeed for that extremely uh, generous introduction, Diana, and uh, welcome everyone to this conversation with Ruth Rendell. Um, as Diana has just said, um, Ruth is one of our most distinguished uh, and acclaimed writers of classic crime fiction. I would say, in fact, that she's one of our two most distinguished and acclaimed writers of uh, crime fiction. Along with P.D. James, uh, she's taken what was already a phenomenally popular genre, the detective story, uh, the murder mystery, and while keeping all the, all the features that give this genre its enormous and enduring appeal, the suspense, the excitement, uh, the whodunit puzzles, um, she's advanced it in new directions and into new areas. Uh, since the publication of her first novel, From Dune with Death, in 1964, uh, which introduced um, Detective Chief Inspector Wexford, um, Ruth has published 23 novels about him. The, the most recent, The Vault, uh, follows him into retirement, where he's still very active uh, as a detective, you'll be pleased to hear. Um, besides this, Ruth has published 26 non-Wexford Ruth Rendell novels, and the most recent of these is the St. Vita Society, uh, which, as Diana has proudly informed us, um, is published in July, but uniquely available here in uh, Charleston uh, after the event. And Ruth and I will be uh, talking uh, about this novel, uh, amongst other things, in a, in a few minutes. Um, Ruth has also published 13 novels under the pseudonym of Barbara Vine, uh, and a 14th of these is due to be published early next year. Uh, she's also written two novellas, uh, I think seven collections of short stories, and a few non-fiction works, such as a book about Suffolk, a county that uh, means a great deal to her, and where she now has a house. Well, it's a body of work which um, not only contains a great many bodies, um, but um, has won Ruth uh, numerous honours and awards. Uh, she was awarded a CBE in 1996. Uh, she was given a life peerage as Baroness Rendell of Baber in 1997. Uh, she's won silver, gold and diamond dagger awards from the Crime Writers Association. Uh, she's a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature. Uh, and in 1990, she received the Sunday Times Award for Literary Excellence, which we give every year. Um, it's an astonishing um, literary CV, I, I, I think, um, both as regards quality and quantity. Um, Ruth's life is one in which she has done a phenomenal amount of writing. And so what I want to ask you first of all, Ruth, is... Did you realise you were going to do this? When you were very young, did you have a strong sense that writing was going to be your career? Do you know, I don't think I did. I suppose the answer really is that I love writing. And I think when I first started to write, I did, always. And I do now. Um, it's what I like doing better than anything in the world. Um, I also like reading very much, as you know. <laughs> but um, yes, if I were, if if I if I if I write, I feel better than I did before I started writing. I mean, at, at, at the time, um, it, it I always it it gives me whatever it's about. It gives me comfort. It makes me feel better. It makes me feel happier which is why I particularly dislike my new laptop computer that I was telling you about in the train. <laughs> that uh, that is, is, is diff well, I'm a bit better with it now, but defying me all the time. Uh, well, I, I feel it's no business to do that to me. Well, I wouldn't worry about that because I've heard that Charleston audiences are notoriously resourceful and there's bound to be some computer technician or engineer <laughs> oh, well, who, will off, who will, will offer you very useful uh, advice after, after the uh, <laughs> that conversation. Is true. But anyway, writing is what I like to do best of all. Yeah, things. you also said that reading is something that ah. you're doing. Did, did you come from a very bookish kind of background? Fairly, yeah. Mm. Yes. Reading was something that we did. Um, and there were a lot of books. 
and my house is full of books now. So that if I haven't got anything to read, which is possible, though I must say you've given me a few ideas coming down in the train, um, and I wish I shall buy. Um, I've usually got a book to read again, as I'm reading, I'm rereading George Eliot, and uh, that's nice. And um, I'm always finding something to reread, and I read a lot. I think people find it amazing. I find it amazing. I, I think it's what I suppose I could almost say. I think it's what one should do. Mm. And I'm, I'm, we were also saying this. I, I, I find it amazing that people don't read. I'm sure they don't apply to anybody in here anyway. Everybody I, I, I reading like It's pretty man. unlikely. I, think. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't think people who know your work well will be surprised to hear what you're saying now, because it seems to me that what, what's perhaps your, your first really major novel and one of your most horrifying and nerve-tingling stories uh, is, is about a, a pathological type running out of control, which is something you do in quite a few of your books, but um, A Judgment in Stone, I mean, actually oh, yeah. it opens with the words, Eunice Parchman killed the Coverdale family because she could not read or write. So, um, you know, you, you clearly do feel that reading is something that is pretty essential, and if it's neglected, then there can be uh, seriously warping results. I think that's... <laughs> Why I've written, first of all, the first of those quick reads, the quick read series, mm. The Thief, yeah. uh, when the, the first series were done, uh, because I feel that it, 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 it must be terrible not to be able to read, and that when people learn to read, and people have written to me and told me when they've learned to read, that the whole world this has been open to them, even when they've only just begun and have got a long way to go. And of course, that's why I've written... A, a, another book for quick reads mm -hmm. which is it's not one version of it is going to be for children the other is for parents to read to parents who have just learned to read to read to their children and I, I'm, I'm very very pleased with that because I think that um, it, it's going to be a, 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 an enlightenment to them and a great help to them. Well, were the particular kinds of book that you particularly enjoyed reading when, when you were a child or when you were a young person? Well, I read all those Andrew Lang fairy books. Um, the, the red fairy book and the blue fairy book and the lilac fairy book. And of course I did. And I don't have any copies of them now. If I had them, I might have given them a go again. And I remember, you know, reading The Hobbit. Oh. When it was first um, published, I was nine and I loved it. And um, I read the first of The Lord of the Rings when I was 29. And, you know, I felt exactly the same about it, I think. Mm. It seemed... Um, I don't know that I would feel quite the same unalloyed joy for Tolkien now, but I did then. And it was, it was amazing. Um, to read that and uh, then of course I read all those classic things like Alice in Wonderland and, and, and so on and Peter Pan and Alice through the looking glass Adam through the looking glass and um, I just read books there we are well when, when you were moving into your teens did, did did you did you start reading any crime novels did did you read people like Agatha Christie oh, yeah. yeah and did did they sort of strike you as somehow being a kind of book that in some ways appealed to you more than other kinds of fiction? I don't think so, but mm. what they did do was make me feel that I would like to give it a go, and just to see if I could, which is what I did with the first Wexford, mm. uh, from doing with that. Um, I didn't, that wasn't a book that I thought I would be published at first, but I just thought, well, see if you can. And uh, I had, a, I think I had a, a good idea for a plot. Mm. And although I had written and I tried to get published other novels, it was that one that my publishers took. And, of course, after all these years, they are still my publishers, which is quite, I think, probably unusual. It is. I mean, I think that's one of the striking things about both you and Phyllis James, that you, mm. you've kept the same, the same publishers mm. with, with, with favour in, mm. in her case. Yeah. But had you... Had you written books and sent them to publishers before from Dune with Death? Or you'd, you'd tried to write books and thought, no, this isn't really working? Well, both those things are true, really. I, I, I tried them, and I had actually finished them. And then I did try one on a publisher. I sent it to them. And they, they considered it, and they kept it for a while, and then they said they would want me to 
rewrite it according to their, uh, um, you know, their ideas. And I didn't want to do that. And that's when they said, "Have you done anything else?" And I had done that first Wexford book, um, and they they did publish it. I, uh, they asked me to do a bit of, bit of rewriting also, and I did. And I thought they were right, and uh, there it was. I always think it was interesting when I. I come to a festival, and this question comes up. I always tell people how much they, the advance they pay for it. Mm. And it was got astonish us. Yeah. yeah, seventy-five pounds. No, really. <laughs> Mind you, it was more in 1964. Yeah. Uh, and then an American editor who was in this country read it and took it and paid me fifteen times that. Really? That was a lot of money, yes, then, yeah. in 1965, by that time. <laughs> From Doom with Death is one of your books that has a very startling twist at the yeah. end, uh, a revelation of gender, just yeah. as in something like Simisola, mm, there's a revelation mm, of skin mm. colour, which is... Um, mm. Obviously, that was something there from, from the beginning. But was, was it a plot that you had to work hard on? I mean, you, it was your first... Um, crime novel, and also not just a crime novel, but a police procedural novel, which I think adds additional demands, really. How, how hard was it to write? Well, I find writing quite hard anyway, mm. you know. Um, as for the police procedural part, we don't want to think too much about that. I avoid the difficulties. Um, <laughs> and uh, you can avoid the difficulties. The, the plot which I thought was quite a good plot. Mm. Um, no, it, it, it was no more difficult than anything that came later. I find all... Oh, I'm doing an enormous lot of rewriting while I'm writing, as I did for a St. Zeta. But um, no more than ever, I think. Um, it's not as if suddenly, or suddenly things got easier. Mm. Or suddenly, possibly, things got much harder. They didn't. No. I, I wondered, I mean, I, I, I don't imagine you did this with the first Wexford novel, but as the series has gone on, I wondered if you sort of felt sometimes you'd, well, as it were, bring in the police to help you with your inquiries, to um, see, see if the police could give you information. And Did, did you talk to police sometimes? Only once. Only once, yeah. Only once. That was in uh, Road Rage, because... Um, there is an element of well, it was when terrorism was begin. It was in the sometime in the nineties, I think, in the early nineties, and um, it was a time when terrorism was becoming um, a, 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 an issue, and everybody was getting very scared, scared of it. And I thought, well. I don't know much about this and the police attitude to it, and I think I ought to know what that is in case I get into great trouble or, 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 and so on. And I did. And I, I, um, I went to uh, give a talk to um, the Suffolk Constabulary for their something like their annual dinner. And, um, they, um, and I asked them, and I asked the chief constable, and... He, he said he would find me somebody who would, would be a, an expert. And he was, this man was, I think he was a, uh, a, a detective superintendent. He was wonderful. He was so very kind. And he told me all about this and what I ought to know and gave me a lot of information and said that, uh, and I said, well, when I've written it, will you read it and check it for me? And he did. Mm. And he was so nice, and it, it, it set my mind at rest. Because I thought, I'm not going to start worrying that, I'm, that, that um, MI5 or MI6 or somebody is going to end up on my doorstep. So that didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs>I mean, I suppose one of the ways in which the, the Wexford novels differ from your other books is that uh, it's not just a situation of, of each novel uh, offering some kind of crime, often a crime mystery, but there's also almost a soap opera element, isn't there, in that you're, you're reintroduced oh, to the same characters and this, you follow them uh, through, through their lives. Is this quite tricky? Do you, do you have to keep fairly careful notes on characters' ages and just what career path they might be following and so on? Not really. It's the easiest thing of all, I think. Is that right? And yeah. you can always look back you know, mm. and check mm. it out. But I was, I was quite interested in Wexford's daughters mm. and the, the things that happened to them and his wife and... Um, 
Yeah, that, that was interesting, and I, I, I liked it. And I was determined that from the start that I wasn't... Not that I'm finding these, these novels that have such characters in them uninteresting or unreal, but I felt I don't want my... Um, my hero is really Wexford is in a way. I don't want him to be one of these detectives and they are legion who before the action begins have, have been married, have fallen out through probably through their adultery or their wives' adultery or something and find themselves having lived in a nice little detached house on the periphery of a, 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 a country town, um, find themselves living in one room in a, in, in a block of apartment flats and um, are drinking too much and, and, and f f uh, uh, falling back on the society of some sympathetic woman, and I don't want that. So Wexford, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know what Wexford, there is one of the, one of the Wexford books, I can't remember which one it is now, um, uh, that he sort of might have an affair with a woman called Nancy Lake, and mm. uh, you're never told. And um, uh, uh, it sort of appears that he might have, and perhaps he doesn't. And, of course, when people ask me if he did, because there was a time soon after this book was published, well, people asked me all the time. <laughs> and I used to say, I don't know. And I don't. <laughs> you see, you don't have to know what happened to your characters off stage, but it did make some people very cross. <laughs> <laughs> one, one thing I would like to know about Wexford is, uh, I, I mean, a couple of years ago, I think it was, I reread some of the very early Wexfords, including From Dune to Death, and um, he seemed to me in the early books to be a much more aggressive figure, almost slightly boorish sometimes. And I had the feeling, and I checked, and it's almost as though a few books in, you had realised that this was going to be a series you were going to be living in. And it was as if you'd sort of sent him on a kind of anger management course or something. <laughs> uh, he suddenly seemed to become a bit more liberal and uh, certainly milder. No, Would this be a fair it's perception? It's not almost so, Peter. It's actually the way it was. Yeah. Yes. Is that right? Yes, yeah, yeah. because I thought, well, I, I, first of all, I didn't notice. I, I really never look to the future. I, don't, I never have. Mm. I don't know what will happen. I thought I might not write another one. I didn't know. Um, I just needed an investigating officer in that mm. first uh, 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 book. Um, and... I, I, I thought, well, um, I'm stuck with him now. I want to make him somebody I can live with, somebody I like, and somebody my readers will like. Mm. So he became more liberal, more literate, more um, sensitive, more, I hope, interesting as a person. And that's how that developed. Mm. Of course, um, eventually he became too sensitive and literate, and we had to cut him down a bit. Yes, yes. Um, so, yeah. just as Burden, his sidekick, um, became too um, too, too prudish, and and mm. he was, and I, I I thought that I would have to um, modify him a bit. And I was talking to some people at, a, at some. Um, book club or society somewhere in Norfolk and I remember um, talking about this and saying that he, he, uh, I felt that he was unreal. He was too um, uh, uh, um, sort of delicate minded and, 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 and prudish for a policeman. And afterwards I was signing books and a woman came up, up to me with, with a book to sign and said, I just wanted to tell you you were wrong there because my husband is a, a detective inspector and he's just like that. <laughs> so, I thought that was all right. That was, that was good. <laughs> it is interesting, isn't it, this relationship of a crime writer to their detective and sometimes feeling that they want to change them. One of the things that astonished me when I, I, I read an edition of Agatha Christie's notebooks that came with some stories that she'd written which had not been reprinted, and one of them was a, a, an Hercule Poirot story, and she clearly had been trying out a different character for him because he was unrecognisable. I mean, he was, yeah. he was Belgian, but he was doing things like scaling walls. Um, <laughs> and he was, he was rhapsodising about the voluptuous curves of a ah. Russian countess and so on. Ah. Uh, astonishing sort of change, you know, from the figure that you would normally um, associate. Um, and another thing that... Agatha Christie said she always regretted about Poirot was that he was Belgian and she didn't really know enough about 
Belgium. Well, it's not quite such a leap for you, but King's Markham is set in Sussex, isn't it? Did you, have you sometimes regretted that, that feeling that, that it's not a part of the country that you know as well as you do some others know? Yes. You have? <laughs> yes, but it's too late. Yeah. I, I, I have visited Sussex quite a bit, yeah. and uh, it, it's, it's there. It's stuck with it. Of course, Wexford does spend quite a lot of time in London now as well, yes. um, which is, is, is better for me. But, you know, you do <laughs> these things you don't know. You don't know what the future holds. Um, and it, it, it's worked out all right. I did, I have, I did live in uh, uh, Sussex for a while as a child um, uh, in Midhurst. And uh, so I could say that King's Markham is Midhurst, but Midhurst, when I went there a couple of years ago, it doesn't seem to me to have changed at all. Ooh. Whereas uh, 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 King's Markham has changed enormously. It, it, it's got council estates on it and it's expanded into the neighbouring villages and towns. So there you are. Yeah, and I, I would relate that, you know, to what it seems to me is another kind of uh, important thing that you, you use your um, Wexford novels for, which is to uh, not just write uh, a crime story, but to investigate uh, contemporary social issues and things of this kind. I mean, there are, there are Wexford novels about uh, paedophilia, race relations, ecological concerns, surrogate parenting. Domestic uh, violence. Domestic violence, exactly. Um, and that seems to be something that came in some way into the series. You obviously realise there's a big opportunity here. And well, what I realised was, and this was, I think, at the end of the 80s, that... Um, I was, there was, a, I'd taken Wexford and all sorts of foreign countries to make, to give me, you know, there you've got him in this little country town, mm. in this, this place, and what more can you do? And I thought, well, we bring in, uh, so I started what I call the political Wexfords, and that started with Simi Solar, oh, yes. um, uh, because that was about race relations in a country in, a, in the countryside as against most of these things are in in cities and this was in the and after that which i thought when i'd done it oh well people aren't going to like this there will be trouble but there wasn't mm -hmm. um i only had one letter from somebody saying not don't do this again everybody else liked it um <laughs> So that was all right. Yeah, and of course you've had the experience of, of seeing your detective on the television screen. Mm -hmm. um, what, what was your feeling about that, about George Baker? I, I mean, he seemed to me pretty ideal for Wexford. Would, would that be your feeling? Well, it wasn't at first. Oh. Uh, when, I, when I saw the cast, I thought Christopher Ravenscroft, um, whom I still see sometimes um, because I... Um, he, Christopher is, is a, a person with a, a, a great social conscience and he and his wife helped to run something called Interact Reading Services mm -hmm. which is something that, read, that, that, that organised people to read to those recovering from stroke, stroke victim. So I still see, see, see Christopher and when I first saw him uh, uh, cast uh, as Burden um, I, I thought he is perfect, he is absolutely my burden made flesh. George I was less sure of mm. uh, because he, he didn't look like my picture of um, Wexford but of course after a time I came to like him very much. He was, he was as you say, uh, excellent, marvellous. Um, and uh, Christopher still looks exactly the same I think. Yeah. Of course George is dead now. He died last year. Um, but um, they were, I think I was lucky with, with, with my casting there. I, I noticed that the last two Wexford, the, the two most recent ones, um, they've been sl somewhat retrospective. I mean, what one of them, uh, the, the monster in the box, is looking back at an earlier phase of his career, isn't it, if I remember rightly? And um, the vault um, is, is a very ingenious thing because you actually use that Wexford novel to offer a kind of sequel to one of the Ruth Rendell novels. Mm. Well, you see, the, the difficulty is, I have written a lot of Wexford books, mm. um, and Wexford now is too old to continue, and he has retired. 
What do you do with him? He's, 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 um, he's not a policeman any longer. But he has to be somewhere, and you know, you can't really go into this stuff of him turning into a private detective. That isn't the sort of stuff that happens. Um, so so he, um, he has to be there, and he has to be helping in this kind of thing, or deciding not to help. Mm. and perhaps looking at it from his own point of view, what to do with it. So that's what I'm doing in the next one. Um, I think it, it works, but it does put a limit on to how often this can be done. But we better not go there. <laughs> well, I, I, I said the last Wexford was a, a kind of sequel to one of the Ruth Rendell novels. Perhaps we could talk about the Ruth Rendell novels uh, for a few minutes now. I mean, uh, my feeling is that in those books, you're, you're very consciously dealing with a different kind of material. Basically, you, you use those books to look at, if you like, abnormal and criminal psychology or morbid psychology, people suffering, afflicted by phobias, obsessions, guilt, things like vertigo plays a role in one of the novel, obsessive compulsive disorder uh, in a novel, in another. Is that something that you've always been interested in or is it something that has developed in the course of your uh, fictional career? I don't think I've always been interested in it. I don't mm -hmm. know. But I know that I, I'm very interested in seeing these things in people. Mm -hmm. um, especially thing like OCD, I think, is it, it, very, very interesting. And, you know, things like, well, um, there have been on television lately um, a series about people who hoard enormous quantities of stuff and fill up their houses and the, 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 these places are, 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 are filthy and cluttered and appalling and they seem to be very unhappy and they can't move and that is the sort of thing why people do that and then of course if you see that you see these things in yourself not that I, I, I'm a hoarder not, not at all I'm it's indeed rather a tidy, sort of pristine home kind of person. But that also is int what interests me. And um, the, 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 um, fear interests me and anxiety. Mm. And all those things, I see them in myself. And fear about catching a train, not that I was particularly frightened today. And um, <laughs> fear, uh, um, um, fear of missing a plane and that sort of thing and in people and what, what it does to them and, 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 and how they handle it or don't handle it. So I think that I began to get more and more interested and then to write about it because, mm. you know, that's what I do. I, I think the people in the uh, Ruth Rendell novels have cause to feel very fearful as well, not just because of the things you've just listed, but also just sheer bad luck. I mean, quite often in, in your books, it's just, you know, uh, a coincidence or an unlucky uh, combination of events that can push a life uh, in a totally different direction. In fact, can push a life towards its ending, towards, yeah, yeah. towards death. I mean, even in the, the, the new book, The St. Vita Society, mm. this happens, doesn't it? Well, and and yeah. another thing that I would link with that is this, uh, one of the features that I think uh, has made your book so very, very popular, uh, which is this absolutely uh, fast, inexorable chain of events kind of narrative. Is it hard to do that kind of story? Do you, do you have to work hard to get that kind of streamlined suspense and momentum? Do you mean a sort of cause and effect? Yes, it? yeah. You, and you and that's, well, just a, a slight accident can almost start the dominoes toppling over, knocking on another that's over. That's because that interests me very much. I, I want to, I'm very interested in contingency mm. among other things and what makes somebody... Um, uh, they, 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 they see something happening and and it, thing, there is this domino effect they will, things will sort of fall over one after another and the, the, the unfortunate person or victim of that feels um, an inexorable uh, uh, destiny I don't believe in fate or, or destiny, of course I don't but um, uh, people do and, and if they do it seems to happen to them one of the things I, I like about your, your new book, your forthcoming book, The St. Vita Society, um, is it seems to me it pulls together a lot of things that you've done in your books. One of them is the interest in morbid psychology. I mean, you've got some very ripe examples of this. In fact, particularly ripe example, uh, the uh, character we're first introduced to. Uh, secondly, um, it's focusing on 
an area of London that it uh, reproduces with terrific authenticity and detail. I mean, it's basically uh, set in a, a very expensive street in Pimlico, and it's about the very wealthy inhabitants and the servant class who sort of cater to their needs and actually turn against them in, in some ways. Um, uh, it's a book that, it's a murder mystery. I mean, there are two deaths in it and a third one looks pretty certainly on, on, on the cards at, at, the, at the end. But I, I felt that there was also an element of deliberate black comedy in this book as well. Would oh, that yeah. be correct? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, well, I, I, I want, uh, I've got my character and I want to make it uh, amusing to people mm. as well. I, I find that you get some, certainly some crime novels, some novels of all kinds that are full of unrelieved gloom. Mm. And, and I, I didn't want that. Um, the, um, I also wanted especially to do their servants, of course. Yeah. Half the characters are servants. But I wanted to show how anybody who reads it and sees it, that St. Zeta is the patron saint of servants, I want the, <coughs> my readers to see that um, it, it, it's, Servants today are a completely different breed from, say, um, perhaps when they were young. If they had, had any, if they even saw any, they're people, but you see, you know, cleaners, drivers, gardeners, au pairs, nannies, particularly mm. nannies, enough of those about. Well, they they all have their own um, their own ways and views and uh, their own strength and uh, and their own um, ability to assert this over their employers so that you couldn't say that um, uh, employers have their will of their servants. The servants have as much of a will of them and, and, uh, and, and as much determination, if not to blackmail them, certainly to f enforce on them their, their, their views and their decisions and their, their ability to leave if they want to and probably to get another job, especially with these nannies, I should think. <laughs> <laughs> And as I, I, I was suggesting, London is very important in the St. Vita society. And, and I think all through the Ruth Rendell novels and some of the Barbara Vines as well. I mean, I, I, I think if I, if I were asked to name the novelist who gives the most comprehensive and vivid picture of life in London over the past few decades, it, it would be you. I mean, you... you, you, you it seems to me I'm fascinated by well, London. Thank you Houses, very much. Yeah. little areas that people yeah. live in. Yeah, I'm always walking about London and looking at it, and I find it very, <coughs> very interesting. And yeah, uh, and um, I would like to think I could describe it so that it's recognisable to people and that they look at it and think, oh, yes, I know that. Yes. I think you describe it so that it's recognisable to people, but also sometimes from very unusual angles. I think of a novel like The Grasshopper, where um, basically, it's made of veil, seen from the point of view of people who wander around on, the, on, the, on its rooftops all the time, yes, well, jump from yeah. one house to, to another. Where did the idea of that come from? It's well, I just moved there, you see, to my present house, and I, I, I walked out into the front garden one day, and there I saw people walking about on a roof on the other side of the canal. Now, um, they were there because they were workmen of some kind. They were doing something, they were mending the roof, but they mm. were walking there with great ease. And I thought, well, suppose, could you do that so that you could walk from one house or block to another? And how far across could you go before you came to the end of that? And of course, there are some buildings near me which are, are six or eight floors high, which would not be, be uh, 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 very high in a place where there were skyscrapers or towers. But uh, for ordinary dwelling houses or, or ordinary blocks of flats, it's quite high. And I thought, well, I think you could do that. And um, I did. And. Uh, People and it worked. It was it was all right. I, I I know that people could walk, and of course people don't really fall off, but they they do nearly do. It, 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 it's it's a bit risky sometimes. Well, it was an eye opener to me, especially as a sufferer from vertigo. Oh, well, it seemed a yes. really strange way of getting I up. I don't. You, see. you don't. Not at all. Mm -hmm. So I didn't go, and I 
there are bits of my own roof I can get onto, but they're, they're because they're only they're only on the, sec the the second floor. But you can get out of windows and and, and walk about on them. Well, I think this is taking. <laughs> I won't, is, I won't take invite you to, to come on. No, the I roof, don't think so. I think this is taking research to heights that people like George Eliot never tackled, really. But uh, I'm, I'm not too surprised to hear you say this because I remember one of, one of the moments when I I suddenly became aware of how very, very meticulous you were about research. It's in 1995 when we were both judges for the Booker Prize. Oh, we were. <laughs> and we met very, very regularly. We had a lot of meetings. And I remember at the end of one meeting, and we read a lot of books. We, we read, I think, more books than any judges before or since because it altered the rules. We read 140 books in five months. That's what we did. Hell. 140 books in five months. I remember at the end of one of our meetings, you saying, well, I've got to go now because I want to count the number of spikes on the railings around Regent's Park. Oh, and I right. thought, well, either Ruth is breaking up under the strain of uh, the book of reading, or she takes research very seriously. And then about a year later, I read The Keys to the Street, which is one of my absolute favourites of your novels. And, and I could see what that research was, was for. So you obviously do take this kind of um, topographical research very seriously. If I don't, somebody else will, won't they? Do you get um, feedback about this? I might, yes, yeah. I do, yes. Not so much now because of the int because of emails, the internet. Mm. And if, you, if people don't know your email address, what do they do? They're certainly not going to write letters. Um, people never did write like, like writing letters that much. <laughs> And uh, again, the, the, I can imagine why rooftops would have appe an appeal to you as well, because it seems to me from reading your books that houses are something that fascinate and intrigue you. I mean, you, you've got novels with titles like The House of Stairs yes. and, and so on. Uh, I, I think that's... And um, I suppose one house, the House of Lords, where you know, you're now a baroness, even that you've put to fictional use, haven't you, in one of the Barbara Vine novels, The Black yes, Doctor? Yes, I have. Um, yes, but... Um, the the I don't know this this this, this business of um, fictional use and and research and so on. Um, I I never do research into anything that doesn't interest me very much. It has to be a, a pattern. I could, people say to me, why don't you um, write a novel? And they name something that is so alien to me, so distant, that the idea of, it has to be something that I like. Mm. Um, 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 researching the House of Lords was, um, was fine, and it was very interesting to do that book at the time. But I also did um, research at the same time haemophilia, of course, mm. so you have mm. the two strands of yes. inherited disease and an in, in, in inherited title. Yes. Yes. Um, so there was that. But, but that was a very useful thing. It was something new and something that interested me mm. a lot, you know. And that was one of the Barbara Vine novels, wasn't it? Which yeah. is the, the kind of third category of your, your fiction. Um, they're, they're books that um, seem to me to be slightly different. I suppose the main difference is that they don't necessarily have a murder in them, do they? No. Do, and they tend perhaps to have a, a longer time span sometimes. Yes, your... and they go back in time. Yeah. They, the Ruth Reynolds don't necessarily, or only about a year or something, but they go back a long time. I think that The Blood Doctor perhaps went back further than any book of mine, mm. because it is in part an historical novel. Indeed, it, it, yeah, it is. Yeah. I mean, the, doc, the blood doctor himself is um, a, a studying medicine, insofar as you did that then, a sort of, well, not very far into the 19th century. And so, um, yes, it did. And others um, went back um, to the, one of them, Astor's book, goes back to the beginning of the 19th century mm. and that was and uh, I like doing that it's very interesting to, we um, have in the House of Lords um, every copy of the Times all bound in, in, in year long uh, uh, um, books um, the, every copy of the Times from 17, 1795 till 1970 75 um, uh, the the actual copy not 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 a microfiche and I wanted to research the Tay Bridge disaster oh. which was 1889 and um, 
I, 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 they, you couldn't take the, they wouldn't let me take the copy out, of course. But I, I had it in the library and I copied it, everything I wanted from it. Uh, of the, the report in the Times of the actual Cambridge disaster, but now you, 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 you can't do that at all. You have to go into the internet for the Times. Mm -hmm. It's gone. They, they're afraid that it will, that, that the light will, even the little dim light that you would get there would destroy mm -hmm. the, the paper, yes. Hmm. Well, the, the, we talk about the Barbara Vine novels, and I, I suppose, you know, perhaps I would characterise them as being uh, more involved with psychological and emotional complexity even than the Ruth Rendell novels quite, 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 quite often. But what I wondered was, uh, when, when you get an idea f for a novel, does it sort of arrive with a little tag saying Barbara Vine novel, Ruth Rendell or Inspector Wexford? Or Pretty do, well. it does. You you, you know yes. what sort of yes, novel it's going do. to be. I do. Uh, yes, because I'm thinking. I've got a sort of idea for a new Barbara Vine. I was thinking I would quite like to do this as a Ruth Rendell, but no good. Can't. Won't work. You can really tell. Yes, yeah. I can work. I'll write it as a, a, a Barbara Vine one day. Hmm. It's probably hard to talk about. I, I always wonder about this process whereby writers get ideas for novels. I mean. Are, are, is it a fairly orderly process with you? I mean, do they arrive at the right time, or sometimes are they all sort of stacked up like planes wanting to land no. at Heathrow? That you're working no. on a novel and you're getting ideas for another one. I might, but only just that much. Not, not, not stacked up. No. 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 Um, and uh, it's. It, it comes, and mm. I'm very pleased when it does. Mm. It, it, if I think it's a good idea, and I would always think that, and if, if I thought it was not really up to much, I would dismiss it. How can you tell? How, how do you know whether you've, as it were, got a novel? Do you have to start writing it before you can be sure about this? Uh, well, of course, usually it starts with some sort of an idea. A, 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 an idea a happening from my own life or something that somebody has told me. Um, that's what, uh, or as in the case of Grasshopper, I saw those people walking about on the roof, you see. Mm. That was an idea. But to try and find something, that won't work. Mm. That is a great mistake. Um, even for the works, of not, it, it won't work. Forget it. Mm. And wait. I have faith in its arriving because it always has. Mm. Do, do places, settings ever sort of trigger off uh, an, a novel for you? Well, yes, or, or, or I would look for that. I mean, when I, I, I found Grasshopper, which is a good example, it had to be London. Mm. I mean, I suppose it could have been Birmingham or Manchester, but I don't know these cities very well, mm -hmm. not the way I know London. Um, and uh, if, if I'm, I'm setting um, a, 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 a novel in, in a, a big house, it's better that it should be in the, the country. Um, 13 Steps Down is set in a big house in London, which is, of course, in, in a certain area of Notting Hill. Mm. Um, I don't think there is such a house there, but there was once, and it's fair enough. And once you've got the idea, do you actually make notes before you start writing? Do, do you have a fairly elaborate plan? No. Or do you just get going? No. I know what I'm going to say. I know what the first few chapters are going to be like. And then when I start, I write down things like people's birth dates and their uh, eye colour. And uh, well, you get to do that and you give somebody blue eyes in chapter one and brown eyes in chapter 35. <laughs> uh, definitely. And um, um, where things take place. And something, but just just little, just a line on 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 sheets of paper, or on a, and um, that that that's enough for me. Um, notes, for me, notes destroy. It 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 it, it won't work. It, no. It, no. But those sort of basic uh, details of appearance, or mm. or. or um, Something in a person's character, perhaps, that's very important. Those things will do. They'll be all right. Mm. And I just wonder, does this, does this always work out? Or are there times when you, you get some way into a novel and then you think, this isn't going to work, and you, you abandon it? In other words, have you abandoned novels? Oh, yes, all too often. Really? But, but not so much now. No.
I think it, 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 it doesn't happen, but I have had it, and I've actually abandoned and nearly finished all this. is a horrible feeling. Yes, mm. but usually, it, now it's all right. I can, I, if, I, if I've got halfway, or I've got a quarter of the way through, say it'll be all right. I wonder if you're ever surprised by what happens in a novel when you're doing it. I, I remember Phyllis James once saying, um, I never get exactly the novel I planned. Is, is that your experience? Oh, yes. But really? I don't mind. I don't want it. No. By the time I get there, that's all right. Yeah. No, but then I don't plan, I don't plan with the care that Phyllis does. No. Um, for one thing, she does make notes. Yes. And she does yes. plan. I don't. And uh, everything will... Because I, I work on the principle that... Um, not with the Wexers, but with all the others, that things evolve or they, they, they develop out of what has gone before. Um, and that's all right. And, and the, so necessarily, in a way, I haven't got the plan. But um, if I begin to make a plan, along, it, it will change. It mm. will be quite different by the time I, I get to the end. I mean, I'd have thought that one thing you'd need to, um, well, either plan or certainly be thinking quite hard about is how somebody's going to get bumped off in your books. I mean, um, you, if you look back now, I don't know if you've ever totted it up, but the number of homicides that you have imagined must be pretty massive. Um, do you spend much time, how can I put this tactfully, uh, uh, thinking of ways in which human no. beings can be violently killed? Yes, uh, if you look at them, you will find that there are very few different ways. Mm, yeah. um, and because it's not important to me. It has got to be in there, but it doesn't matter. No. Um, and as for elaborate ways of killing people, I'm not going, I'm not going to go there. I, I think <laughs> you're you're not a believer in the rare Peruvian poison in this No, case. because the rare Peruvian poison has gone away, hasn't it, now, long ago. Mm. Think of the... Um, did you ever read a novel by A.E.W. Mason called The House of the Arrow? No. Well, do. It's well yeah. worth it. I recommend it. The House in Lordship Lane and The House of the Arrow, they were published in during, I think, the First World War. Mm. And um, He's the Four Feathers man, isn't he? Yes, he, he is. He, yeah. And he also wrote a very strange book about India called No Other Tiger. Mm. But I don't know where I've kept that all these years because I didn't think much of it. But anyway, as one does <laughs> these strange things... Uh, but the, the, the House of the Arrow, of course, is the book that introduced to the reading public um, um, the, the what's, it, what's it called, the, 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 the arrow poison. Um, oh, yes, Curare. Curare, yeah. Curare. And it, I think it's in that book that it turns out that you can, you can eat or drink as much curare as you like without coming to harm, but if, if you should inject it or somehow or other get it in the bloodstream, that is, that's the end for you. And it, it is a good book because of course, um, everybody now knows very well that, uh, uh, about curare and what it does, but the house of the arrow. Mm -hmm. I think there's a house in it with... Um, a, a picture or carving of an arrow on the gatepost or something, mm. and of course this is tied up with curare. I mean, one thing that just made me wonder uh, whether you might have an interest in uh, rather unusual ways of murder is that I know you're a very big fan of Conan Doyle and the Sherlock Holmes stories, and uh, you, I think you edited the most recent Penguin edition, didn't mm. you? Um, and of course, unusual ways of killing people are pretty much the four there, aren't they? But maybe it's more the portrayal of London, is it, that you admire in Sherlock Holmes? Think how long ago they were written. Yeah. And when all this stuff was new to people, mm. and. Mm. I like London, the London part of it, mm. but I just like the writing. I like the character of Holmes and Watson and these people. But it doesn't mean that one would have any idea of writing that sort of thing oneself. It's gone, mm. and it was great at the time. Mm. Uh, and, and that's it. I think that I don't think readers are interested in how people are, are done to death in these books. Besides, it's even guns. Of course, you can get guns I I anywhere at time you, you like in this country, but it's not like America, is it? Where um, in part, in, in great parts of America, everybody owns a gun. Mm. But to, we still, that is those of us who are um, uh, respectable people, um, uh, uh, do think there's something wrong in owning a gun. 
found out, which a lot of yeah. Americans wouldn't dream of thinking. Yeah. It, in fact, they think it's right. It is, it is uh, I think, the I mean, Third I'm Amendment? I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, I mean, I, 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 take, I take your point, right? It's just I, I feel a certain kind of wistfulness, you know, for these really baroque, unusual murders that you get in classic crime fiction. Yes, you do, and very good they are, too. Oh, I think my, my all-time favourite is, a, I, think it's a, I think it's Niall Marsh, actually, and there's a concert in a, a, va a church hall, and uh, they substitute the pianist at last minute, and a pianist sits down to play, um, I think it's a piece by Rachmaninoff, and all goes well for the first few minutes, and then she fatally presses the soft pedal of the piano, and a shotgun that has been booby-trapped inside the grand piano shoots her through the head. And yes, I think, well, well, I wouldn't mind a, a bit more of this kind of thing uh, uh, occasionally, but I, I, I do take your point. But you say... It's like lock rooms, Peter. Lock yes, rooms the lock rooms, room, yes. But yeah. people, but then now there's the... No, Marjorie Allingham has a yes, lock room, I yes, think. Yes. And they are... But you couldn't do that today. We have too much technology um, today. Things like today. mobile phones and so on oh, that are always cool. yeah. there's a problem. Uh, but, I mean, you say all that's gone, but it's not quite... I mean, the, I think one of the nice things about you, one of the things you ought to feel very proud about, is that, you know, you, you are um, part of this tradition. You've, you've taken something that has proved an incredibly popular genre, a really enduring one, and you've modified it, and you have turned it into something more sophisticated and subtle. You've turned it in new directions, but it oh, must be good you. to feel that, you know, there is that behind you, and uh, you, you, both you and Phyllis, I, I think, would feel that, that you've moved forward in, in, in very interesting ways and kept the genre alive and still responding to fresh things. Well, I don't know. I've never really thought about it. And somebody who asked me this once, I said, I don't do pride. <laughs> and I think I don't. I think I'm quite pleased I don't. <laughs> well, on that very self-deprecating <laughs> note, I'm, I'm going to uh, now move on to the second part uh, of this afternoon, which is to uh, throw the conversation open to members of the audience. I'm sure people here have got lots of questions. Um, we have roving mics, so... Um, if you could wait until the microphone is in your hands till you ask the question, that would be good. Uh, so if you put your hands up, anyone who would like to ask Ruth a question. Yes, there's someone there. Be a handy way to start. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Mike. My, my question is related to technique. You alluded to taking effect? notes or not taking notes, and you alluded to your new laptop, which is trying to make decisions for you. Um, but I'm curious, Nabokov, for example, is, was famous for you know, writing his novels on three by five cards um, to the end. My, my question is, how has technology changed for the better or for the worse what you do over the years? And, and by the way, you can probably tell from my accent I'm American, <laughs> and I share your sentiment regarding guns, and I don't own a gun. <laughs> so. Where do you live? I live in Atlanta. Okay. I think if you had lived further west in the United States, you yes. would be more likely to have it. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. Now, what did you ask? I forgot what you asked me. I'm so sorry. How, how technology oh, has yeah. impinged on your work? Well, it has made using a, co a, a, a computer, but then I, I've used a computer for 27 years. But... Um, it hasn't made writing any easier for me, except that it has made it, it doesn't take so, perhaps so long, but the, the writing isn't any easier. Um, other sorts of technology, I think I mentioned that I don't get so many letters from people because they don't know what, what my email address is. Um, other things, what would other things be? Um, Research, for example. Oh! Oh, well, yes, the internet, of course it has, of course it has, and very nice too, yes. Um, I, I suppose if I had been going to write The Blood Doctor today, I probably wouldn't have tried all those copies of The Times, or that relevant copy of The Times, but I'm, I, I would have missed that because I like that. Because I, I do use the internet because it is so easy, um, but... I, I'd rather read. A, I'd rather look a book, a book. I'd rather go to the Encyclopedia Britannica or some other uh, um, encyclopedia. 
and I'd probably find it all, except you, it's such a heavy lot of stuff, isn't it, that one's got all around one. But um, yes, I wouldn't like to think that technology made, made it, um, I think facile is a somewhat different word, it has a different meaning from easy. But many people would say it doesn't. But I don't want my work to become facile. And I think that if I were very, very good at technology, which I'm not, I'm all right, but um, I think it might get that way, and I, I would rather not. Right, thank you. Let's take another question. Uh, who else would like to ask a question? Uh, yeah, gentleman here, please. <laughs> I'm just reading The Vault, and uh, I notice you've uh, retired Wexford, and that he's in London, and he's sitting around waiting for his pal to come along and offering him a job. Uh, do you envisage continuing with him for some time yet in retirement, or is this uh, is the end of the line for Wexford? Is it the end of the line for Wexford? No, um, I don't think so. No, I know it isn't. Um, yeah. But... Um, but uh, I, I think that I have to be careful what I do with him mm. because he can't continue to be a policeman. He must not become an amateur policeman. No, no. Uh, that mustn't happen. But I think I can do it. If I have other aspects of his life come in, which are quite interesting, mm. I hope, mm. and keep on with what Peter called the... Um, uh, um, the, the sort of soap opera aspect of him, the, the, his, his children and yes, their yes, children, and, and so on. And just as in the vault, um, you know, uh, um, Sylvia has this affair with this very young man yeah, and it yeah, leads yeah. to a rather a, 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 an unfortunate ending yes. for him. I think we can have more uh, uh, things like that. Yeah. And also, Wexford in... Uh, being invited by Burden, which he will be, yes, to yes. to help in some sort of innocuous ways that he yes. may not like, but he will also um, find himself again, almost against his will in, in intervening and doing mm. things and then regretting it and yes, wishing yes, that yes, kind yes. of thing will happen. Yes, yes, so, yes. Um, but I don't think that there will be many, yeah, but yeah. there will be a couple. Is there another one on the way, or are you... I'm not answering that question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll, we'll, draw, we'll, draw, we'll draw our own conclusions from that room, I think. Yeah, right. yeah, I Let, so. Let's take another question that you may answer. Um, <laughs> anyone else? Yeah, lady here, please. Uh, the microphone for you, thank you. Um, can you tell me sort of on average what time, length of time it would take from you getting an idea for a book to it being actually published? Ooh, mm -hmm. I don't think I can, but I can, I can give you some sort of rundown of what would happen. I get an idea and I'm probably still writing the previous one. It would just be there and I would think it's, so it's, it makes it very hard to tell. Um, I would say that once I begin to write, it takes me about nine months, three quarters of a year, time it takes to have a baby. Um, <laughs> in a way, I suppose it is a sort of baby. And, um, and then when I've finished it, I mean, people, the public, always think that when you finish writing a book, it gets published within weeks. In fact, it too takes three quarters of a year, probably. It's a long time, isn't it, Peter? Mm. And um, now, the St. Zeta Society, when was that finished? Oh, I should think a year. Oh, it would have been a year ago, certainly. <coughs> so the whole process of it is going to take two years. Thank you. Right, is there another question? You want, a uh, yes, there's some, uh, somebody over there. We'll come back to you in a second. Oh, actually, it might be easier if you, the microphone say so We'll come to you in a second. Yes, I always think when, I've, um, um, he, when I read a Wexford book, I always have George Baker, the actor, in mind. Oh. To what extent are you influenced by the actors who play your characters? I would say not at all. I think I resisted that, but I, I am 
uh, affected by their appearance. Now, with the appearance of Christopher Ravenscroft, that wasn't a, a, a problem because he looked just like my idea of Burden before I ever saw him. So he fulfilled an idea of a man's appearance that I didn't know I had, but I, I knew it as soon as I saw him. But George didn't look at all like uh, Wexford. Wexford, who is described in an early book, probably in From Doom is Dead, is described as an ugly man. And George is a good-looking man, or was, poor George. And um, um, he's also, George, very dark, or as Wexford described as being fair. And his daughter, um, Sheila, is very much like him and is a blonde. So the only thing they have really in common is that they're big. And uh, George is a very big man. And um, also very inclined to put on weight. Um, uh, uh, Wexford has problems with his weight. And he, um, when he in London, and he was in London for a long time, he really enjoyed walking about London, which he never walked about King's Markham, of course. And um, he did lose weight. And he also did a sort of healthy diet at that time. I can't remember why, but he's lapsed on that one, I can tell you. Um, <laughs> so, so there you are. <laughs> sounds like retirement might do him a world of good, I think. Well, yeah, now, over here, please, yeah. Hello. You have touched on this already, but um, I'm very struck by how much contemporary crime is unbelievably violent now, and how very misogynistic a lot of it is, much of it written by, by women. And I just wondered if you had any observations about that and whether you think there might be a sort of law of diminishing returns on very violent um, crime rating. You know, I've been asked this question often and I don't know the answer. But I used to think it was because um, uh, it's like what Samuel Johnson said about uh, uh, women preaching. Um, you know, it's like a, a dog standing its hind legs or something. But because, but this is, this is three hundred years ago or something like that and um, uh, he, he, he really means that it's so extraordinary to see a woman preaching that people uh, uh, um, feel like that about it. Well I think that when women were first writing crime which is going to be who do you think Peter in the, in the t Agatha Christie um, I mean, there, there, there are sort of quite minor women writing crime novels right at the end of the 19th century. So, yeah, but they, they've not survived, that's the thing. Yes, the yes there are, there are uh, Victorian novelists mm. who wrote things that were, that were, have a lot of crime in them, and women yes, did. Yes, yes. Um, so, but I think that by the time that, that, that they were, say, at the end of the teens of the, nine, of the 20th century, in the beginning of the 20s, it was sufficiently remarkable to people to find this, that, that women could write about so much mm. violence. And this is a hangover, because of course now it's sort of accepted that women are, well, at least as good at it, not better than, women, than men, and mm. I don't know. So I don't yeah. know. Well, from the 20s you get that, don't you, really? If you think yeah. back to the you know, classic crime writing of the 20s, the 30s, it's women's names that will come to your mind first of all, yes, I think, it is. don't you? It yeah. is, yes, it is. And I, but I think that it's still, at that time, certainly, and for a long time, it was astonishing mm. that it should be so. Um, right, yeah. I think there's some more people over there who uh, have thumbs up, yeah. Um, I was just wondering if you could tell us how you came by the pseudonym Barbara Vine. Sure, easy. Barbara is my second Christian name, and Vine is the name of one of my great grandmothers. <laughs> and I thought I ought to have um, um, uh, uh, names that were sort of um, familiar to me uh, 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 familial and that, that, that would mean something. Um, I was going to call myself Emma Vine at first because that was this grand, great grandmother's Christian name but, and I like the name but my agent said it sounded like a, 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 a romantic novelist. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't do it. And I took Barbara which after all is my second Christian name. Um, any more questions? Yes, someone here, please. 
Um, in your conversation with Pete today, you mentioned um, a couple of times thinking about your readers um, wanting to make London recognisable and talking about comedy. Um, my question was about um, during the process of writing, um, how much thinking about your audience um, weigh, weighs on you? And also, is that something that changes as a novelist starting out wanting to get an audience, but then having an audience once you're established that has expectations, does that change? Well, of course, when I wrote the first one, I didn't think it would ever be published, and I, I, I didn't have any expectations of, or, or project any expectations on my um, audience. Um, I don't think very much about them, not really. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't alter all sorts of stuff to suit them. But um, in some ways, I mean, I want them to understand what I mean. For instance, Peter was talking about the keys to the street, which is all about Regent's Park. I was living near Regent's Park at the time. And uh, I, I do want pe people who read it to, to see, and I imagine all authors do that, that I, I didn't want people to see that this is where you go into the park, this is where the Rose Garden is, this is where, at that time, there were a lot of street or ground sleepers in the park. I didn't want people to see that, recognise where they would be and what they were doing. But beyond that, to adapt everything to suit what I think there would be their taste, no. Any more questions? Yes, uh, gentlemen here, please. Uh, just here, please, yeah. It's on its way to you. It's like the Olympic torch. Yeah. <laughs> Only a little bit faster. <laughs> well, the Englishman needs time. Uh, length. When you're discussing with your publisher, does he say... I want so many words, maximum or minimum. And I noticed in the development of some of the books that the period of introduction and background takes about half the book, and that's why I thought maybe the publisher said, I'm sorry, this is too much for a novella and not enough for a novel. We, introduction to what? Well, I was thinking more recently of The Bolt. There was a lot of introduction in it? As far as I was concerned as a reader, yes. Oh. <laughs> oh, well, all right, if you say so. Um, my, my publisher, incidentally, is a woman. But my, well. but my editor is... is, is uh, my, my, edit, uh, my editor now is a woman, too. Um, but, um, no, they never discuss it with me at all. Oh. I just write a book of the sort of length that I think will do. Um, um, nobody ever, dis in fact, people don't discuss anything at all about it until they've got it and they might question something that they feel a doubt about, but very little. Right, I, I, another question was there. Um, yes, the lady there, please. Which is your favourite book or the one that you're most proud of? Well, as I've said, it, we've been there with this pride thing. I don't think I'm <laughs> proud of anything. Um, which maybe, which? maybe of the um, Barbara Vines, The Dark Adapted Eye, of um, the Ruth Rendells, maybe The Keys to the Street, or it could be a, a more recent one, um, but I don't know. Um, I, I, something I just like best. Um, it, it might be um, 13 steps down. I rather like that. I think it's got a good twist at the end. Um, I, I was just going to say, I just lent somebody yesterday a Dark Adapted Eye and recommended it as my favourite of your books. So there well, we go. Thank you. Sounds um, as though you were bang on target there. So that's a... Yes, yes. Well, um, Ruth is now going to go and in a few minutes and uh, sign copies for anyone who'd like them of her new book, The St. Vita uh, Society. But uh, before she does that, uh, on behalf of myself and uh, everybody here, I really would like to say thank you very much indeed, Ruth, for a really fascinating conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, thanks. Ruth, you said in relationship to one of your novels that you slightly regretted setting it in Sussex, <laughs> given that you're so familiar with Suffolk, Suffolk and London. Well, I'm glad we were able to lure you down here <laughs> and experiment with Sussex again today. Um, I'm very, very glad. <laughs> Thank you, Peter, for demonstrating that not only do you know um, about St. Zeta, but you know the whole of Ruth's uh, uh, amazing <laughs> oeuvre. And we're going to ask you to come to the back of the marquee, uh, 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 you know, to the signing table. I'll ask the audience to remain sitting. Um, and I'm sure that somebody will come um, with uh, the answer to your computer problems and uh, oh. any of your other plot problems. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Peter Kemp and Ruth Rendell. Thank you. Very much.